My name is Dr. Lena Edwards, um, and I practice in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, Balanced Health and Wellness Center is my practice. I'm um, very heavily involved with A4M, and, and the topic that I'm going to speak on today is one of the various topics that I typically speak on with respect to HPA axis dysfunction and adrenal dysregulation. And I've done a lot of, of research, speaking, writing, um, over the course of the last seven or eight years on this topic, so I'm very passionate about it, and it's extremely complex, and, um, and so it, it's, that's, that's why there's so much confusion associated with how to properly treat it, because there are a lot of different things that affect uh, adrenal production of cortisol, and it isn't as straightforward as, um, you know, one person has adrenal this or give them this gland or there's so many other factors that are involved with what the eventual outcome is from the adrenal gland and how it actually produces cortisol. And one of the things that I'm going to speak about today is actually the different ways that the body has in place to regulate how cortisol is actually produced. And I, I know probably by looking at the title of this slide, I'm sort of giving you the punchline but one of the most amazing things I think I've realized in my research over the last few years is that the adrenal gland has its own clock. And what I'm going to talk with you about today is the influence of that clock on how everything else works, including how the adrenal gland itself produces cortisol. So that's where we're going to start. That's the, the premise of our beginning of our discussion here. Now, I didn't, I was having a struggling sort of in what order to put these slides in, but, uh, but I wanted to start off with this slide, just giving you a basic idea that, mo you know, most of us believe that the circadian pattern of hormone release originates in the brain, in a place called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is located in the hypothalamus, okay? Now, for those of you that have done additional research with respect to HPA axis dysfunction, you will know that the hypothalamus is not the only central center that controls cortisol release. The hippocampus is also extremely important, and that's part of the brain that's unrelated to the hippocampus. I'm sorry, unrelated to the hypothalamus, and it actually controls, it's one of the control mechanisms of cortisol release and cortisol regulation. All right? So one of the reasons why, as Dr. Wilson pointed out, one of the reasons why cortisol may go up in people as they age is because their hippocampal volume decreases as they age. Okay? Now, one of the things that in, in trains and and, and sort of controls the entire circadian rhythm is the SCN within the hypothalamus, okay? It is known as the central clock, the main regulator of the circadian rhythm. The fascinating thing about this area of the brain is that each cell within that portion of the brain has its own autonomic, uh, autom automatic circadian rhythm activity. So it has, each cell has its own autonomous rhythm. So when coupled together, that is the central circadian pattern. So when you look at light, which is the very, this probably the strongest elicitor of, of the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the, the pathways that then dictate cortisol production, when light hits the retinal ganglia, there's a direct relationship, there's a direct connection to the SCN, which then increases cortisol through, through a variety of different mechanisms that I'm going to show you here in just a moment. Okay. Now, the majority, I would, I would say the majority of people, again, that, that look at the research, realize that when you're trying to assess someone's HPA axis function, there are different tests available to do so, but I think that it would, it would be fair to say that probably salivary cortisol is becoming the most reliable, the most well-researched, and, and probably the most well-respected with respect to um, measuring, measuring HPA axis activity. Now, when you're looking at someone's salivary cortisol, probably the most important one is called the cortisol awakening response. All right. And I'm bringing this up now because I'm going to tell you why and how this response actually evolves. There is a lot of research on the cortisol awakening response and what abnormal cortisol awakening responses imply with respect to underlying disease states and disease reactivity activity. Okay. But... The cortisol awakening response, the morning cortisol level, is affected by a lot of different things that may not have anything to do with HPA axis function or dysfunction. Okay, so when you see someone who has a low morning cortisol level, that does not necessarily mean their HPA axis doesn't work because it's affected by genetics, it's affected by gender, it's affected by the time of the year, it's affected by medications, and a variety of other things. Okay, now, what I'm going to be speaking to...